This is Tall Tale TV, your podcast for sci-fi and fantasy short stories. Of Tyrants and Tea Kettles by Leslie Heron. Chapter 22, Solanum. Ah, uh, Piper, have a seat. We have much to discuss. Elias presented her with a warm smile as he gestured to the vacant chair across from himself. He sat poised at his desk, as if he had been waiting for this meeting for some time. Piper finally managed to wrench her arm free and was ready to hurl another laundry list of colorful insults at her captor when tragedy forced her down into the awaiting chair. She didn't need to look around the room to know where she had been brought. The workshop was recognizable even through the sheer amount of students and professors who were preoccupied with dismantling the brass arch of the portal machine. Thank you, tragedy. You may go. Elias returned his gaze to the girl and pulled his glasses from his face. He set them down on a desk and pinched the space between his eyes with a tired sigh. I apologize for having you brought here like this. I know we're not on the best of terms right now. He picked up his glasses and slid them back onto his face. And you may not even want to speak with me, but this is a conversation we must have. Piper pulled her attention away from the other people in the room to level a narrowed gaze on the Inquisitor. You're right. I don't want to speak with you. She folded her arms in front of her as she crossed one leg over the other. Then I will do the talking. Elias pushed his glasses up the bridge of his nose and looked into her eyes with a calculating stare. As if debating his words, he dragged his fingers along the stubble on his chin in a moment of contemplation. I can move no further in the protection of the city and its people without Atticus's robot. Piper's nose wrinkled as her face pulled into a grimace. What's that got to do with me? There's no way I could just give you my brother's robot. It's like family to him. Elias pushed his fingertips together, resting them against the surface of the desk as he did. I'm fully aware of just how he views that machine, but what if we were to replace it with something better? Piper scoffed. She might not trust the robot, it might even be a spy for Chester, but there was nothing that could replace it in her brother's eyes. Elias reached beneath the desk and produced a brown folder, sliding it across the table in front of her. When Vel informed me of your past, I sent in a request to some of our clerical offices. He flipped open the folder and sat back. The results eventually led to a full-blown investigation. Piper glanced down at the folder. Her heart squeezed tight, and her stomach rose into her chest. It felt like the wind had been knocked out of her. She reached out, her trembling fingers clutching the yellowed edges of a photograph. It was her mother but not as she remembered her, perhaps a little older, with a streak of gray in her hair. She held the hand of a man she could only assume was her father, her memory of his face not as clear. A glimmer of hope shone through the haze of doubt as her fingertips brushed against the paper. How? When was this taken? It took a lot of man-hours to track those two down. We combed through days' worth of transportation and deportation documents. A wistful smile broke over Elias's face. This photograph was taken three years ago when your parents crossed our outer borders into western Austria. He placed a hand on the documents, sliding a few of them around to reveal numbers and names. I was unable to determine if they're still there, but included is a list of possible contacts and locations for you to investigate. Piper tore her eyes away from her mother's face, staring at the sizable stack of papers inside the folder. Three years was not that long of a time. There would still be a trail. She swallowed hard. It was possible. Elias moved the final leaf of paper aside to reveal a signed proof of residency document listing her parents as citizens of Avis and a single airship ticket initialed by the harbor master. All I ask is that you convince your brother to allow me to replicate his robot and I will send you off with ample resources to find your family and bring them back to him. The anticipation would provide him with quite the distraction from his loss, don't you think? Piper couldn't stop the tears that slid free from her eyes and rolled down her cheek. Her mouth was suddenly dry, and her tongue felt like leather. 
Everything she knew about this man was true. He had just offered her a poisonous apple and had the nerve to think it was generous. I'm not leaving my brother here with you. Piper, please reconsider. After all, I'm not leaving my brother here with you. The words broke her heart. This decision meant she might never see her mother again. But there was no way she could abandon Atticus to fend for himself in this monster's care. Elias pushed himself to his feet, the chair screeching across the concrete in his wake. He swept his hands towards the crew of scientists around him. With our knowledge and resources at hand, your brother could change the world as we know it. He placed his palms flat on the desk and leaned in closer. Are you certain you want to take him away from that? Piper refused to flinch and kept her gaze unwavering. Her golden eyes bored deep into the Inquisitors as she nodded. You're right. My brother could change the world. But under your hand, I don't think I would want to live in the world you would have him create. A muscle in Elias's jaw twitched as he straightened his back. Piper placed the photograph of her mother back into the folder and gently closed it. If you want Berg, we'll both be leaving on that boat. Bill wrapped a knuckle on the rough wooden table, fishing a few more coins out of his pocket. Another, please. Something a little stronger this time. He sat at a small outdoor bar that had been erected beneath a large canvas tent. The weathered counter was lined by several wicker stools, yellowed with age and a plump man covered in brilliant yellow and red feathers stood on the opposite side of the table, cleaning cups at a dizzying rate. He was one of the few bird people Vel had seen since leaving Silverport. The rotund man swiveled on his heel and clicked his beak a few times as he reached for a pitch-black bottle. Being a bartender oftentimes meant masquerading as a therapist, and he prided himself on his ability to keep his customers talking and therefore drinking. So, if I understand right, you want this Piper and Elias to get along, but Piper doesn't trust him, yes? Vel looked up from the man's velvety plumage to the glass that was pushed towards him. The small ceramic cup was filled with a potent-looking crimson liquid, steam roiling over the sides, despite it being room temperature. He watched the twinkling lights dance across the surface for a moment, before replying, Yeah, I guess. She just doesn't understand why he does the things he does. It's not that he's a bad guy, he's just... driven. The bartender ruffled his feathers a little and leaned against the counter. It seems to me you are trying to convince Piper by making excuses for Elias. This is an empty gesture, as it is not you she doesn't trust. Vel paused, the edge of the cup sitting against his lips. What do you mean? I may just be a bartender, but I've heard a few tales and done a few things I can say I'm not proud of. A faraway look shone in his watery eyes. Silence stagnated the air between them as he reflected on distant memories. But one thing I do know is that an apology from someone else means nothing. If they personally do not apologize or explain their behavior, how do you know if any of it is true? Vel thought about this as he pushed the cup against his lips once more. The liquid burned his mouth and his throat but left a sweet, aromatic fragrance behind that reminded him of hot tea. <coughs> so, what you're saying is that I will never convince her. Only Elias can do that. Precisely. Now, I've served many a cup of wisdom in my years, and while an apology doesn't cure all wounds... It goes a long way to start the healing process. Vel nodded slowly and choked down the remainder of his drink, gasping as it burned his nose. The bartender was right, and as much as he didn't want to admit it to himself, the solution to his problem was probably 
to let Elias try and defend his own actions. He tossed a few extra coins on the counter as he stood. Thank you. Al scratched at his chin nervously. No, you're sure you can't take the legs off the tea kettle? Does it really need to be mobile? Atticus looked up from the pile of gathered notes over to Alphonse with a half smile. <laughs> well, of course it needs legs. How else would it bring me tea? Al pushed his forehead into his hands. Has the bloody thing ever actually brought you anything to drink, or has it just wreaked havoc on its way over? Atticus stacked the papers in a neat pile and stroked his chin in thought. Hmm, now that you mention it, it hasn't. Perhaps it needs more mobility, maybe wheels. The creaking sound of an opening door distracted Al from the argument about not needing to weaponize the damn thing farther. He looked up to see Atticus's sister walking in, the Inquisitor's two bodyguards following close behind her. He felt his body snap to attention and his hand flew up in a firm salute. Sir? Ma'am? Piper gave a dismissive wave as she looked around the room. Put your hand down. They're not here for you. She spotted her brother hunched over a table, furiously scribbling something on a scrap piece of paper. Her eyes moved from junk heap to junk heap until she found Berg, reassembling the shattered remnants of Atticus's once-proud tea kettle collection on the other side of the hangar. She turned back to Alphonse, who had relaxed back into a slouch. Can you go over there with them? She pointed at the twins. I need to speak with my brother alone. Al wavered on the spot for a moment, before falling into compliance. Piper moved over to Atticus, who had yet to notice her arrival. She reached out a hand and placed it on his shoulder. She chuckled a little when he jumped at the startling gesture. It's okay, it's just me. Oh, hey Piper! Atticus set down the oil pencil he had been using to scribble down his additions to the tea kettle and turned to face his sister. Where have you been all day? I've got loads to show you. Did you bring that along? Piper couldn't fight the guilt that was twisting her guts into knots. Uh, no. He said he had some things he needed to do today. I got you something, though. She licked her lips, gathering her courage as she reached into a pocket and pulled out the tickets. Well, us, would you like to go for a ride on one of those airships? Atticus's eyes went wide with delight, something she hadn't seen since that one birthday where Chester had let him dismantle an automobile engine. Oh, would I? Can Berg come with? He took a couple of steps towards his robot, all the while keeping his sights glued to his sister. Piper put her hand out to halt her brother. Y you know, Berg's had a rough couple of days. Why don't we leave him here so he can get some rest? Atticus's face fell for a moment, and then he nodded in agreement. That is true. He has been feeling under the weather. He gave his sister a warm smile as he plopped his hat on his head. We'll just have to bring him along next time. Does that mean Al can come instead? Al opened his mouth to respond, but a heavy hand on his shoulder encouraged his silence. Tragedy gave a small nod in an apologetic fashion. Alphonse has been reassigned and must return to the university for his new orders. We will remain here and look after your machine until you return. He glanced over his shoulder at his porcelain-faced twin, who nodded in agreement. Piper gave her brother a genuine smile. Are you ready to go, then? Vel wanted to go straight to Piper. But he knew anything he said right now would just make things worse. He settled for dealing with the hard part first, confronting Elias. The bartender had been right in that no amount of excuses would make this situation better, and the only way to fix it was to have the High Inquisitor step up and explain himself. Vel had walked these particular halls of the university often enough to know his way by heart now, and pushed against the door to the chamber that housed the portal machine. As the heavy slab of metal swung open, he could see a small army of students rushing about and a clatter of metal at the disturbance. He muttered a hasty apology and began closing the door, unsure how he had gotten lost. Ah, all sorts of visitors today. The familiar voice stopped Vel, and he peeked back inside. 
Elias moved out from behind a desk and invited the cyborg in further. A genuine smile tugged at the corners of his mouth at the sight of a friendly face. What can I do for you? Vel began to relax, but as Elias laid a welcoming hand on his shoulder, he felt the urge to recoil. I just came from the slums. Elias moved back to sit at the edge of a less cluttered table and grinned. The slums, you say? Where they were handing out the food? I thought you might approve of that. He waved to a vacant chair. Vel folded his arms across his chest and shook his head. No, oh, no, that was great, sure. The people were thrilled. I've never seen a crowd that happy. He took in a deep breath, steadying himself for what was to come. But it was the dozen bodies hanging in the street that I wanted to talk to you about. Elias turned to one of the students just behind him. Could you and the others take a break, please? I need to speak with this man, alone. His words were kind, but the urgency in his voice told them not to dawdle. Vel watched the students set down their items and vacate the room in a hurry. As they dispersed, he could see the portal machine was in a state of paused dismantling. Boxes with part labels were strewn about the floor, mingling with the sheets of papers that depicted highly detailed schematics. He turned back to the Inquisitor. What's all this? Elias gave a feeble gesture to the remnants of the device. I've explained it to you once already. In order to handle the stress of the mathematical computations, I need more robots to power the lever stand, and those are in my other workshop. We're moving the project over there to expedite the process. He hesitated before adding, You do want to go home, don't you? Vel chewed on his lip for a moment, nodding his understanding. He looked around and watched as the students vacated the room with haste. He wouldn't allow himself to be distracted from the situation at hand, which hung heavy like a weight between them. Once the room was clear, Elias let out a heavy sigh and folded his hands in his lap. I took no joy in that act. Bell brought his attention back to the Inquisitor. Then why do it at all? I had to show my people that I am a man of my word, and that I can be trusted to do as I say. Vel rolled his eyes, dropping his hands to his side. I get that. I'm glad you got rid of the street sweepers. They were horrible people. But why not just fire them, or send them to prison? Why take it as far as you did? Unfortunately, that was not an option. Elias stood and tucked his hands behind his back as he began to pace. In a situation like this, if you do not remove the head of the snake, the problem will just return. There is always another corrupt politician or another backroom deal to be made. He paused, absentmindedly picking up a power coupling off the desk and moving it from hand to hand. If I did not make an example of these individuals, a true representation of what lies in store for any who would act as they had, it would inevitably happen again. I sentenced twelve people to death to save countless more in the future. He turned to face the cyborg. Okay, fair. But you didn't have to kill them. Shame them, take away all their worldly possessions, send them to the mines, put them in pillories and let the people spit on them. Anything else would have been better. It's unacceptable. Elias sighed and rolled the coupling back onto the table. I appreciate your opinion, and in the future I will take it into consideration, but I was not aware that I needed a clear state policy with you. Vel scratched at a spot behind his ear, almost as a reflex. I didn't say that. He lowered his hand again. And you don't have to run things by me. It's just, between this and the army of robots, I'm starting to understand why Piper sees you the way she does. Elias took a step forward. Oh, and how exactly does she see me? Vel's mouth formed a line, almost wincing as he said, A tyrant? Elias maintained his composure, but he couldn't hold back the twitch that spasmed under his right eye. My duty is to be a sacrifice, the hand that guides this nation to the future they deserve. How they see me as I do so is irrelevant, so long as I deliver them in the end. If the choices I make to ensure the safety of my people paint me as a tyrant, then so be it. 
Mel took a reflexive step back. Were those men and women you executed not your people too? What about them? Elias exhaled slowly through his nostrils as he struggled to regain control of the conversation. He opened his mouth to respond when the door swung open. Mel looked over his shoulder as the porcelain twins walked in, Berg fidgeting nervously between them. His attention snapped back to the Inquisitor as he felt a stab of anger hit him in the gut. What is he doing here? It is here, because it, too, is a sacrifice for my people's future. Elias shifted his gaze from the cyborg to his bodyguards. Take him to the other workshop, please. I shall join you momentarily. Vel felt a wave of anger and betrayal roil up within him. Atticus would never have agreed to this. What have you done? A deal was struck with his sister. She and Atticus are gone. Berg belongs to me now and is no longer any of your concern. Vel began to advance on Berg, but stopped as tragedy stepped purposefully in his path. He watched comedy steer the robot back out into the hallway. This isn't right. Piper would never let you take her brother's friend. Vel may not have known the girl for that long, or that well for that matter, that there was no way she would agree to this without Atticus's approval. Elias took a step back and then moved just behind his guard, motioning for the cyborg to exit through the open door. Perhaps you don't know her as well as you think. He was done with this conversation. Vel narrowed his gaze and shoved past tragedy, heading back the way he had arrived. We'll see about that. Of Tyrants and Tea Kettles is book two of the ongoing Psy Fantasy series by author Leslie Heron. Join us as the adventure unfolds, with new chapters releasing every few weeks. And then they just up and leave. Not a care in the world for what happens to old Alphonse, no. But that's how it is. You pour your heart and soul into protecting an unstable genius, and then poof, back to traffic duty. You know, I may just be a bartender, but I've heard a few tales and done a few things I can say I'm not proud. Oh, shut your clacker. I'm paying you for drink, not for therapy. Besides, everyone knows you give out piss-poor advice, just so as your customers end up more depressed and come back later to get properly plastered. Skeezy old coot. <laughs>